What part of your house have you sort of discovered has become your favorite room in this time? Um, well, we have sort of like an open plan kitchen living room thing, and I'm spending most of my time here. My couch and I have become very well acquainted. It's where I do most of my reading, my eating, <laughs> my watching TV. I'm, I'm glad I invested wisely in a very comfortable one. <laughs> so tell me how you've been spending your days. I mean, I've seen that baking is happening, running is happening, sketching is happening. Like, how have you been getting through this time? I mean, it's been up and down. I had that, I had a good charity challenge that I was doing because so many charities in the UK have been experiencing this kind of downgrade in funds. We, we did a whole charity day. And so, yeah, I, I had a great week leaving up to that where I was really, really busy. I was, I was, I haven't sketched in years and stupidly, I gave myself this task of, uh, drawing over 20 of the cast members or the characters in the show. And that was, uh, yeah, that was a full-time job for quite a few days. And uh, the results were not, um, didn't really show, I would say, all the hard work that went into it. But it was it was really fun. And that was really nice just to do something very creative and, and fun in that way. But yeah, bit of exercise. Um, but yeah, lots of eating. And you have to cook it to eat it. So that's been... That's been mainly it. It's just, it's not very exciting over here. Well, and I see you've been watching normal people. What are your thoughts so far? See, I, I'm a lover. I got to say, I'm a lover. And it's also, I, I, I've heard some people sort of make complaints about it's not like a typical teenage thing, but I think it's very typical for Ireland. You know, I think it is, it has such a specific tone to it that just brought me straight back to secondary school, like our high school. And it's, you know, even just those kind of relationships at the school and who was cool and who was not and the kind of difference between people who have money or who are a little bit outside of the kind of core group of people. I thought it was so true. And and yeah, I've, and I've watched the entire series and I'm devastated because I've no more of it to watch. How do you think Claire would be spending her time if she was living through this moment? Like, would she be on the front lines treating the patients? Would she be trying to help, you know, come up with a vaccine? Would she be at home with her grandkids if she has more grandchildren? Um, would she be home? Like, talk to me about what you think she'd be doing. Well, I think Claire is sort of perfectly prepared for this kind of thing. I mean, Claire would would be the one character that I think would do really well. I think she would be working on the front lines. I think she would be sort of all hands on deck trying to help and barking orders at people to make PPE for everyone <laughs> and, um, you know, scolding people for not washing their hands enough or not listening to uh, the advice. Yeah, I, I think her skill set would come in really well during this time. But I actually think that most actors would actually benefit more from knowing more about what goes into the production. You know, I love it. And I definitely don't want it just to be a vanity title. You know, I want to be as proactive and as invested as I'm let. You know, I, I think it's just, it's fascinating, you know, especially when you've been on a show for five years and you're sort of playing the same character you want to keep learning new things and you want to keep growing as a person and professionally. So in that way, it's been really good. Well, so Claire went through a really harrowing experience in the finale. She's kidnapped and brutally raped by a gang of men. And the writers decided to use disassociation to tell her story. So she goes in and out of a, a dreamlike sequence during the attacks. And You've read the book, so I'm sure you knew this was coming. What was your approach to getting into the psychology behind that scene? Yeah, well, we very early on, um, Max came to us and, and said that they were going to pull this particular storyline from book six into season five. And he talked a little about this idea that he had about not wanting to show the rape or not wanting to be kind of gratuitous about it and that he would that he had this idea to sort of show this disassociative state that she would go somewhere else in her mind when it was happening and i thought that that was first of all a really interesting way of doing it 
Um, but without reading scripts, you always have this worry about, well, okay, but how are you going to do it? And I also really wanted to sort of protect Claire in the fact that, yes, why do we need to see another rape? But also, if you're going to do it, then we can't just gloss over it and that somehow Claire doesn't get affected. Because one of the things that I love about Claire is that everyone talks about what a strong character she is, but there's a danger in that then people sort of make that character Teflon and that, you know, somehow, oh, that could happen to her, but it wouldn't really stick and it wouldn't really affect her. And I, and I thought it was really important to show that no matter how strong you are, no matter who you are, that if you go through something like this, it's, first of all, you, you don't know how your body is going to react. You don't know how you're going to be able to process it. And nobody comes out of anything like this unscathed. And so I did a lot of reading about women who unfortunately had gone through um, situations like this and about sort of disassociation and about that idea that sometimes also, you know, once you've gone through so many different um, stages of fight or flight, because Claire is in this ordeal for such a long time, that when the actual fact was happening, that she that her body and her, she just shut down. And so she goes somewhere else to protect herself. And then, and that's the one thing that where we went over success of scripts because I didn't want it to be that she goes into this other place and that we sort of get lost in this um, 60s vignette and we forget that actually the reason that we're there is because something really horrific is happening at the same time. And so we we sort of worked really hard about trying to sort of have these little bleed-ins of, you know, she's trying to construct this safe place for herself, but, you know, it's, it's not a uh, perfect, mo you know, it, she can't quite block everything out and that you get, you tend to get these um, moments where, where the sort of horror of what's happening bleeds in again and again. And, you know, we also changed what happens in the book. You know, I think book readers will see what they think, but, um, you know, the, the post ordeal and the post rape is very differently handled in the book. And for me personally, when, again, it's that thing, if you can read something and you can sort of patch over the time constraints, or you can patch over sort of certain ideas, but it was, it was very, um, clear to me from the get-go that we couldn't film certain things that were in the book. You know, I think in the book, Jamie and Claire have this very intense sexual moment and it just felt that that was wrong, um, you know, just even physically for Claire, but also, you know, when you are doing one-hour episodes to have something like that come off the back of something where you see Claire go through this terrible ordeal, it just didn't feel appropriate. So I think we we sort of tried to find another way of doing it. So you have this sort of shot where Jamie's just holding her and they're both naked. And I think that that sort of shows you that no matter what happened, it hasn't completely destroyed their intimacy. And Claire is not, at least at this moment, that's you know, it's, it's baby steps and she will take need time and she will need time to heal and, and come out of this, but that there is strength in the fact that, um, you know, Jamie is there for her and he's able to understand and, and hold that space for her. And then there's a very small, it's a very small percentage of people who just seem to love to hate shit, you know, and they just want to, make people's lives misery and be heard. And, you know, I try to have compassion for those people because it's obviously coming from a place of pain. You know, that's, that's how I have to think about it. I can deal with it when it starts to have people sort of say really mean things about my husband or stuff like that, which I see. And sometimes people feel the need to tag me in this stuff. And I'm like, why do I need to, I don't need to read this. Um, but then you get defensive and you sort of want to protect the people in your life. But, you know, as I always sort of say, the good far outweighs the bad. And I 
you know, it's most of it's online and there's a really, really easy way of dealing with that. Just don't read it. Don't go online. <laughs> Take a break yeah. from all of it for a little while. And I, I tend to do that. You know, I think sometimes it, it can, I, I understand, you know, we have to go online and stuff like that for work and there's certain things you have to do, but it's also okay to take a holiday from it and really just close the door on it and live your life.